on your oh. apps. Yes. You had democracy as one of the strengths, but is this not also one of the weaknesses? Uh, yes, if you don't play it right. I mean, it's the same with all the apps. I mean, it depends on what you do with it. I think uh, for a long time in its history, the West was actually relatively good at dealing with democracy, and democracy wasn't always as chaotic as it is today. If you go back 100 years, you can see that government spending in most Western countries was just around 10% of GDP, which nowadays, of course, seems ridiculously low, and yet there were democracies. I mean, Britain had its most successful period, arguably, in the 19th century, when it was already um, a democracy, more or less, more or less, with a parliament at least. So you can play democracy as well, but what we have seen is, of course, a kind of an entitlement democracy where uh, you have countries now where the majority of voters have um, some kind of stake in the welfare state, and of course they would never vote against their own interests. So that's a, the, the advantages and, and disadvantages of democracy. On the other hand, if you compare them now with the um, authoritarian model, uh, uh, dictatorships certainly have some disadvantages. And just look at China's one-child policy, and you have a good example there. Yeah, I, I, I just want to uh, carry on with this uh, one-child policy of China. Uh, from what these projections show, it's going to be a golden age for China. But this one-child policy will have its social and economic implication. Mm -hmm. It was introduced in 78 or 79, and the parents of that one child would now pretty much enter into their probably 60s. And then they said they have this one, two, four. Uh, so then China may s have a problem of labor shortage. Oh, definitely, yes. And, and will that have a hiccup in Chinese progress? Yes, um, that's true. China, um, China's working age population will peak um, sometime this decade. And um, the Chinese certainly have a program that built in. However, um, I mean, China's a tricky story because you never quite know which figures to believe and which statistics. I mean, the Chinese are still claiming to grow at 8.5% when all the trade statistics actually point in the other direction. But in, anyway, accepting for the moment that the statistics are right, I think there is still a good chance that they could keep these levels for some time, even with a stagnating working age population, because they still have enormous movements from the poor rural regions of China into the cities, and with that comes usually, after some time, some degree of productivity increase. So you still have an enormous potential to turn hundreds of millions of really poor productivity, um, po poorly productive Chinese into highly productive Chinese people and, uh, and consumers. So this may keep uh, going for some time. However, um, long term, I'm not that optimistic about China, but I'm at least hopeful that by the time that China really slows down, I'm not saying that it crashes, that India will be ready to take over. <coughs> Would you expand on what you mean when you say we should be as good as Asia? Well, uh, what it means is that our political climate reminds me more and more of Europe. I mean, I've been here for three and a half years now. I came from Europe, and uh, I've always been full of admiration for Australia, and uh, I still love this country dearly. However, what I see in day-to-day -day politics reminds me more and more of Europe. We've got exactly the same uh, sclerosis in our political process. That haggling that we see on a daily basis on, on, in Canberra is just unbelievable, and I'm more and more despairing that what we are seeing here is just a repeat of the European experience, maybe with 20 or 30 years to go. If this goes on, if we have a government that's chronically overspending, and if the best the opposition can come up with as an alternative to this government is more spending policies, I think Australia is doomed as well. It just will take a few decades longer. And that me, oh, to answer your question, this has to stop. We have to be as good as China and as good as uh, Indonesia and as good as India in terms of moving forward, developing our economy, becoming better at what we're doing and not just relying on our wonderful resources and our wonderful heritage that we have here. I mean, there are so many things that are good about Australia, but I think we're in the process of forgetting them just by following failed European policies. Um, I was, I was um, fascinated by the analogy the current analogy in Europe now between Europe and Europe in, in the interwar period when um, democracy was clearly failing and, and um, the likelihood of an authoritarian right wing um, a resurgence. I just wonder, Merkel, um, and she's coming up for re-election soon, and with the capacity of the right wing in Germany to uh, mount a reasonable opposition, and, and, and secondly, um, 
with the, with the nature of the of the sort of level of of social dislocation, with youth unemployment in Spain being 51 percent, um, the likelihood is that social disintegration is likely to overtake any theoretical economic response that the euro might come up with. Mm. Well, on the first question, um, I think the likelihood of a repeat of uh, um, national socialism in Germany is zero. Um, there is no uh, right-wing party uh, really to speak of in Germany, and Angela Merkel is firmly established, I think, as chancellor. She may have to find a new coalition partner in the election next year, because her current coalition partner is down to just about 2 or 3% in the polls and may not even re-enter parliament. But um, Angela Merkel's approval, in, approval ratings are just uh, phenomenal. Um, strangely enough, I, I don't really think she's doing such a good job, but anyway, the Germans believe it. And um, the reason why they believe it is precisely because they don't have that kind of youth unemployment in Germany. And uh, actually, if <coughs> employment in Germany is an, at an all-time high, unemployment is at a 20-year low, the German economy is growing, they're benefiting from the crisis around them, and uh, everything is fine. So if there's any uh, chance of um, some kind of um, civil unrest or the rise of some nasty parties, I don't really think it is going to happen in Germany. There are other candidates. I mean, Greece is always just one step away from civil war, and we have seen how difficult it was to introduce some minor reforms last year, and they usually lead to um, general strikes and protests in front of banks and in parliament. Um, Interesting to watch, I think, uh, the French presidential elections. There is still a chance that Marine Le Pen, if she gets the uh, nomination even, because she's still trying to get the 500 signatures together, as you may have heard, um, but that she may even um, get to the second stage of the uh, presidential elections. So I think there is a right-wing potential in France. Um, other countries, I mean, Spain seems to be a stable democracy nowadays. However, with youth unemployment over 50%, how long can this last? So I see problems for democracy in other European countries, but certainly not in Germany at the moment. Sorry, and your second question? Well, just the, whether the social impact of, uh, of all this dislocation, I mean, you have a, 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 large, um, a large liability of current pension entitlements in Europe, and uh, all of them are unfunded, mm. and all of them are coming out of particularly say Greece, you know, the poor people who are left working and paying tax are supporting all the pensioners in, in the balance of the country. So, you know, that's just cl clearly unsustainable. So pensions will need to be cut, and that will be socially hugely unpopular and, and likely it, to lead to more social dislocation, I would have thought. And if you are one of the four remaining Greeks who work, you would probably try to leave the country, wouldn't yeah, you? Yeah, well, I met three of them in... in yeah, see. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, I mean, that's, hap that's what's happening. We had uh, record levels of immigration from Europe. Um, and actually, that this may be one of the uh, ways in which Australia may actually benefit from that crisis, because we have record levels of migration from, um, from Ireland, from Greece, from other European countries. And um, many of these migrants, I mean, these are young migrants. These are hungry migrants. They want to have a better mm -hmm. life. So they are perhaps the most entrepreneurial of the people that you would find in these countries, and they're coming here. So I think we should welcome them with open arms, because we're getting people who are already educated. We don't have to pay a cent for their education. And I think we should just say, welcome, come here. Um, Oliver, you, you say that Greece would probably be better off if it left the euro, because if it had a new currency, that could depreciate and make it more competitive. But isn't the situation, though, that they, their government debt is denominated in euros? And in which case, if they were to leave and their currency were to depreciate, they'd have to pay that debt back in even higher terms than mm. what it is owed now. OK. Um, um, uh, let me just answer that briefly. Yeah. Um, yes, in principle. Um, however, I think a Greek departure from um, the euro would almost necessarily involve um, also defaulting on that debt. There's no point um, leaving the euro and keeping it. <laughs> keeping the debt. <laughs> Similarly, I, I don't see the point in what the European Union is trying now to have Greece default on part of its debt and stay in the euro. That doesn't make sense either. But there's a second answer to your question, and that is actually a Greek uh, peculiarity. 95% um, of uh, Greek debt is actually um, issued under Greek law. And there's a clause in Greek law that allows any Greek government to redenominate the currency of its borrowing unilaterally. So the Greek government may just uh, say, well, sorry, um, 
we just um, had a second thought about it, and uh, your bonds are now denominated in drachmas. In mm -hmm. new drachma. Right. Yes. <laughs> Which we just devalued, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's converted <laughs> one to one, but the yeah. it will allow it to devalue. Yeah. Yeah, I found it uh, interesting to read an article in The Australian today by Henry Thornton. It is the nom de plume of a prominent economist that says, maybe you've read it as well. It says, it is impossible to be on top of precisely what is happening in Europe from here, but it is a fair bet that the longer the currency union holds together, the more likely it is that disaster will be avoided. Now, I'm, I'm from the Netherlands, and I mean, I don't, I don't have an economic background, trying to get a grasp of it. One day you read an expert who says A, next day you read an expert who says B, but you speak to everyone in Holland, everybody will. You know, most people say, why did we ever start this euro? But you can't say it out loud. You're almost an outcast. Why do we keep getting this message? Why? They don't even explain it. You know, Angela Merkel, Sarkozy, Mark Rutte. Mm. We have to stay in the euro, otherwise it's a disaster, without explanation. But the Dutch are, of course, very sensible people. Mm. And um, I always wish I were Dutch, because the Dutch are just like the Germans, but nobody hates them. <laughs> <laughs> Be that as it may. <laughs> um, I actually think that um, Henry Thornton in this case is probably uh, wrong, although I actually know who's behind that name and is a good economist. But um, no, the, the, the problem is actually uh, maybe this is what he's referring to. They're building up enormous liabilities and uh, they are making it almost impossible for countries like the Netherlands and Germany to depart because once they depart, they will have to actually take these liabilities, liabilities and pay for them. One thing I didn't mention in my talk, um, this is a very complicated story, let me try to sum it up in a minute. Um, it's a so-called target two mechanism. It's a mechanism that is established by the European Central Bank and it facilitates intra-Eurozone payments between commercial banks dealing in these countries. Now what happened after the GFC from 2007 was that uh, capital transfers between richer countries and poorer countries basically dried up because nobody wanted to give the money anymore. Actually the reverse happened. That, uh, people in uh, Italy and Greece and Ireland tried to get their money out because it, they thought it was safer to put it in Dutch accounts or in, in German accounts. So in order to basically keep the system going, the European Central Bank stepped in and allowed other countries to print money. Allowed the Greeks to print money, allowed the Portuguese to print money, the Irish to print money. And that money, that printed money, freshly printed money, flowed into that core of the Eurozone, basically into Germany and the Netherlands and a bit of Luxembourg. And their central banks built up enormous claims against the Euro system. And so Germany is now sitting on claims against the Euro system, basically against all other European countries, of half a trillion euros. That's what um, other countries owe Germany, which is fine which is a technicality because it doesn't matter that much. It doesn't affect the Germans at the moment. And the same is true, by the way, for the Netherlands and for Luxembourg as well. Except the moment the whole thing collapses, somebody would have to recapitalize the Bundesbank by half a trillion euros. So the, Germans, um, the German government would have to jump in to save their central bank, otherwise it's bust. And that would cost them half a trillion. And in that sense, sorry for the long answer, Henry Thornton may be right, because they're building up all of these positions, and on top of that now the longer-term refinancing operations, and the more of these positions they are building up, the harder it will be for Germany to pull out, because once these trillions of euros of longer-term refinancing operations are done, Germany knows that the moment it pulls out, it will be bankrupt. And so Mario Draghi and the other leaders of Southern Europe are trying to lock Germany in, and the Germans can't escape. It's, a, it's an ingenious policy, but it's pernicious. And maybe in that sense, Thornton may be right. Um, I think you've written about the Rogoff and Reinhardt analysis of all these prior sovereign collapses. And I think the conclusion that I read in their uh, material was that um, once you get to given levels of uh, debt to GDP, of which now the four core currencies around the world all are either hovered or gone way beyond. So if you look at a consolidated Europe, followed by an America, and then look at the yen or, and uh, Japan and the UK, none of these countries, uh, or none of these um, currencies can survive. So my question then is, what becomes the unit of wealth that actually is worth our while looking at? And is it a renminbi or a rupee or is even an Australian dollar or an ounce of gold? So where do we finish up? What's the end game in the currencies? It might be gold, it might be silver, it might be copper. I mean, we're seeing some movements on these fronts. We're seeing moves um, that the Chinese are putting more of their reserves into commodities. 
It is happening. Um, there, as I said in one of these slides, there is no monetary anchor at the moment, and what follows is very hard to predict. But um, it's quite clear that we are really moving fast towards a point where um, people simply lose trust in the established currencies in the US dollar, in the euro, and nobody knows what's going to happen afterwards. I don't know. Oh, don't touch it. <laughs> um, <coughs> competition between European countries is one of the killer apps. Would you like to see more competition between states in Australia? Or Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Not just between states, between councils. Yes. I mean, we published um, papers on that. We published papers about competition between councils for inhabitants, for taxpayers. We published lots of papers on restoring federalism at the centre. Mm -hmm. They're going back to the 1990s when Wolfgang Kasper was here and published papers on that. No. I, Competition is one of the killer apps of the West. Competition is one of the reasons why the West grew richer and Asia for a long time did not. Um, there is an enormous literature in um, economic uh, um, literature in, in, in uh, um, written by historians, by economic historians, detailing really why it was that this strange looking half continent of Europe actually developed because of all the principalities and kingdoms competing with one another and why China did not develop because it was a monolithic thing where there was no competition happening. And unfortunately, the West has lost that app because we are trying in Europe now to harmonize everything. And they are now, yesterday there was a new initiative by the German Chancellor and the French President about harmonizing um, uh, income ta corporate income taxes. I mean, that's ridiculous. I mean, they should compete. They should compete for companies. They should compete for the best way to regulate an economy, the best, way to, the best health system, the best tax system. But Europe has lost it. Europe has tried to harmonize everything. And I think in Australia, we have certainly gone in this direction as well. I mean, a good start would be to return income taxes to the states. Um, could you um, uh, expand a bit more on why you are so seem to be so negative about Germany? I un understand the underlying message that the collapse of Europe is going to prove how um, unsustainable the general social democratic idea is. But for those of us who'd still like to believe that it was possible to run societies by being nice to each other, Germany seems to be a great uh, light. We have cooperation related to the boards of, of German companies. We have central planning. And as your economic statistics show, we have great success. Now, where are you on Germany? Is it going to collapse or isn't it? Is Germany a social democratic success or not? First of all, I've never heard Germany described as a country where people are nice to each other. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I can't help being negative on Germany because I'm German. But um, <laughs> more seriously, um, there are fundamental things that are simply wrong with Germany. The only reason why Germany is doing well at the moment is because it is benefiting from the problems of its neighbors. Think about why German, Germany, why the German, uh, German treasurer is now able to borrow <coughs> in markets long term for about 2%. The last um, short term debt auction actually they had negative interest rates. So if you wanted to give money to the German government for the next six months, you actually had to pay them for the privilege of taking your money. But why is that? Is it because Germany is a, a very sound, a fiscally sound country? No, of course not, because Germany stands at 82% debt to GDP, which is actually still higher than Spain. So Germany is not that sound. The only reason why they're getting these ultra-low yields on their borrowing is because they are seen as a temporary safe haven. But the focus is here temporary, because long term, the problems for Germany are just as dire. <coughs> Germany stands at 82% debt to GDP. The unofficial debt to GDP burden for Germany may be around 420%. And that is because Germany, for example, has a largely unfunded public sector pension scheme. It has unfunded state pensions. It has a worsening demographic situation. And to just give you one figure that really sums it all up, in the next 40 years, Germany will lose about a third of its working age population. How on earth you can keep this country going with just two thirds of its working age population? Anyone's guess. It's not going to happen. It's not going to work. The Germans are benefiting from a set of circumstances that are unique and that are never going to be repeated. They are benefiting <coughs> from a, a subdued exchange rate that reflects Greece. They're benefiting from low interest rates that reflect Greece. They're benefiting from their status as a safe haven. That's also because of Greece and Portugal and the others. And that is Germany's strength. Germany's strength at the moment is the weakness of its neighbors. 
and they brought down their unit costs, and they managed to really <laughs> Yeah, um, you, you, you say bailing out the periphery in Europe is uh, sending good money after bad. Is, uh, is a two-tier uh, euro a total disaster? A two-tier euro? Yeah. So in North Europe and South Europe, that's better than nothing. I mean, I would like to go back to national currencies, but if you can't get that, yes, why not? You can't get that. However, um, the, the tricky question when you split the eurozone in two is what do you do with France? I actually think that France should join the Southern Club, club because they are really like them. And I mean, French economic um, philosophy is pretty much Southern European and not Northern European. I mean, we're talking about Mercosur, but really, it's not really a union, right? It's a union of convenience. So taking out France and putting them into the Southern Bloc and establishing a Southern Euro and a Northern Euro sounds all very nice, but politically, it's going to be extremely tricky because, again, economically, what would make sense is to take France out. Politically, this is completely impossible because it goes against 60 years of um, post-war European integration. Oliver, are we looking at a slow motion train wreck or something that's going to happen sooner? And how safe are Australian banks in all of this? Um, <laughs> it's probably more a slow motion train wreck than the Titanic because the Titanic only took two hours to sink and in Europe we have been dealing with for, for two years now. So it's a slow motion train wreck, yes. Um, will Australia be affected? Yes, um, in an indirect way. Um, I think there are a number of transmission mechanisms at work. One, of course, is the slowing China. China is, of course, uh, the Europe, uh, actually the European Union is China's biggest trading partner. So if uh, Europe slows down, if Europe collapses, China will feel it. And we can um, export our commodities to China, which they would turn into consumer goods, which would end up on European shelves. So that's one way how we would see it. The other transmission mechanism is, of course, that European banks currently engaged in Australia would try to actually pull out. They would try to pull all their capital back to Europe because that's where they need it now. And in, in that sense, it could become very problematic for us here. And then, of course, I mean, all the ramifications of what all that means, um, collapsing com commodity <coughs> prices, uh, reversing the uh, fable in terms of trade that we're experiencing at the moment. Yes, sure, we would feel it. We're not immune. However, at the time of um, this Euro crisis, um, would I rather like to be in this part of the world or straight in Europe? I think I stay here. 